I hear myself. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. It is good to finally be here. And it's so good to see all your faces. Just know I'm horrible with names. I apologize in advance, but I'm really looking forward to getting to know your names and match them with faces and to be getting to know you. My family and I are really excited to be here. I will introduce them at the end of the sermon time this morning. How much time do I actually have? Three minutes. That's what I was feeling. So, <laughs> Okay. We're going to scoot. We're going to scoot. This is good. I'm going to learn. The Bible says, trust in the Lord forever, for in God himself we have an everlasting rock. Isaiah 26, verse 4. Back in the 1800s, there was an Italian sailing ship that was sailing off the northeastern coast of Britain, and it got caught in this terrible storm. In fact, the storm was so bad that it blew the ship several hundred miles off course, and it was in big trouble. Now, this ship had 17 sailors on board, and they saw that as they were getting close to the coast, that they were going to run into the rocks, and their ship was going to be destroyed. Now, what was beneficial to them, what was in their favor, were there were some Englanders that were up on the shoreline, and they saw what was happening to this Italian ship. And so they ran to the nearby town of Blythe, and they rounded up some rescuers, and they came down to try and rescue what they knew was going to happen to that ship, rescue those 17 sailors from the destruction that was going to happen to them. The problem was, is they could have taken some boats out to get them, but if they did that, then they all would have been dashed to pieces, so they had to come up with a different method. Now, the town of Blythe had dealt with shipwrecks before, so it had a special contraption that it had built for just such a situation as this, and it had used it many times. The contraption was one where there was a weight tied to a really long rope, and it would be shot over the bow or the stern of the ship, and the hope was that the sailors could take that rope, wrap it around the mast, and then they could crawl on the rope to safety, and it had worked many times. So the townspeople of Blythe, the rescuers got together, and they set up this contraption, and they shot the weight over ship, and then they cried out with all of their might, grab the rope, tie it on to the mast. But the Italians didn't speak English. The Italians thought the Englishmen were trying to kill them, and so they dove for safety. The onlookers had their eyes wide open with anticipation as the rope was shot over the ship again and again, and the people were crying out with all their might, grab the rope! But the Italians would not come out of hiding. If only they had understood what their rescuers were trying to do. If only they had understood what they were trying to say. For the graves of 17 Italian sailors lies where that ship crashed against those rocks and they were lost. Won't you pray with me this morning? Lord, this morning we're asking that you would speak with power. Lord, we're not really having a sermon this morning. What we're doing is walking through a story of how you have led us here and how you've guided us and how you have walked with us when we have been unsure, and you've held our hand all the way. And we know that now as we look forward walking into the unknown, we're going to hang on to your hand and we're not going to let go. Lord, bless this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what I decided to do this morning is rather than dig into a Bible story and open that up, which we're going to do lots of that, trust you me, I wanted to share with you a little bit about our journey here. What in the world is God trying to tell us? 
That was the question that Constance and I had in our minds as we boarded the plane in Pasco, Washington, heading this direction to come and check out Cleveland, Tennessee. We had never heard of Cleveland, Tennessee. Cleveland's in Ohio. What is this? (laughs) Every person since then who's asked us, where's Cleveland? Isn't that in Ohio? No, Tennessee. No, I think it's in Ohio. It's in Tennessee. We've been there. We were wondering, what in the world is God trying to tell us? We were agonizing over this question eight months ago as we boarded the plane. See, not too long before that, Pastor Rick Grieve had called me when I was in the Walmart parking lot. While I didn't recognize the number that was in the phone, as soon as he started talking, I knew who I was talking to because over 25 years before, he had been my pastor when I was a student at Shenandoah Valley Academy in Newmarket, Virginia. I knew who I was talking to and I was like, hey. (laughs) And he began to talk to us about this church, Bowman Hills in Cleveland, Tennessee. By the way, Rick, I wanna tell you, your voice hasn't changed much in 25 years. The timing to Constance and I was very interesting. We had just been called to take a church in Anchorage, Alaska. My wife's from Chile. (laughs) Snow and dark don't mix with Chileans. (laughs) But we had been given a call there, and no sooner we come back than the vice president of the conference in Alaska who had transferred to Nebraska asked if we would come and be considered for a church in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then about this time, after an executive committee meeting, the vice president of the Upper Columbia Conference tells me, we have had in the last several weeks, seven conference presidents calling to speak to you about taking churches in their conference. We're going, what in the world is God trying to do? By the way, you might think that when a pastor gets a call, that it's something that is um, inspiring. Actually, it's terrifying. Because the first question that comes to your mind is, does God want us to go? Does he want us to stay? What is it that he wants us to do? And you don't want to put yourself in a place where God has not called you to go because when times get rough, you want to know that he's with you. And if he has called you, you have the certainty that he will be with you through whatever you may face. We loved our church in Pasco. We still love the members there. We have so many dear friends, and while COVID had made a rather challenging time for us, the church was open again. People were coming. Our ministries were starting up again. People who had been hesitant to be involved in anything were starting to be involved again. We felt like things were beginning to pick up. And then we had an evangelistic series coming. It was going to be our first post-COVID reaping efforts that we would make. And we had planned for it for several years. We had everything lined up. Was God calling us to leave now that things were picking up? All of these were the things that were swirling around in our heads and so much more as we made our way to Cleveland. We arrived in Atlanta, April 21 at 7 a.m. after 12 hours of a work day and an eight and a half hour flight. By the way, I was told that I say that word wrong. Apologize. When we were in the interview, um, one of your search committee says, it's Lana, we'll learn (laughs) you. All right then. I'll learn it. We began our drive to Cleveland two hours. Our first appointment was to meet with Rick for lunch. He took us to the Olive Garden over here, which was wonderful, but we were exhausted. It was like 26 hours before we got sleep by the time it was all said and done. After lunch, we headed back to the hotel and we went to bed at like three o'clock in the afternoon and we didn't wake up until seven or eight the next morning. We were whipped. The plan while we were here was several fold. One of them was we wanted to explore the area, kind of see what's around here, what what does the town look like, and we wanted to look at the housing market in case we were called here. We wanted to know where are the areas that you want to live and where are the areas that it's best to stay away from. Where are you going to start looking if you end up here? 
And the third one was we wanted to covertly spy on this church. We wanted to be able to sneak in under the radar without anyone here knowing who we were or what we were doing here because we wanted to see what is this church really like when they have no idea someone's spying on them. And so we made our way here on Sabbath morning. We actually entered in the back of the church down there on the entry level and I want to tell you, there were a number of things that just really impressed us about this church. Now, I'm not going to tell you all of them. Maybe at another time I'll spread out more since I'm tight on time. But what I do want to share with you are five in particular things that really stood out to us that meant a lot to my wife and I and our kids. The first one was we were greeted at the door by somebody who then walked us through the church to orient us so we knew where things were. Now, they didn't bring us up to the baptistry and the platform, but they showed us where the restrooms were, where the classrooms were. They showed us where the things that we would need to know were. And then they invited us to either stay in the primary room where my daughter Gianna would go or in the kindergarten room where my daughter Catalina would go, or they showed us a number of adult Sabbath school classes that we could join and be a part of, and they left it up to us to choose, but we felt warm and welcome, even though they had no idea who we were. You guys had no idea who we were. Most of you had no idea who we were. (laughs) The second thing that really impressed us was the quality of Christian education that was taking place in those children's divisions. Christina, I think you were teaching primary that day, if I remember. And I went in with Gianna, and Constance, my wife, went in with Catalina to the kindergarten room, and we sat there in awe at the level of Christian education that was taking place there. It was excellent. Something that is very different in the West Coast than we noticed out here, which was interesting because the way that you guys did it out here is the way that my wife and I were raised. Those kids were attentive, engaged, and involved for the entire hour. And they weren't running around every five minutes to a new station. It's very different than we're used to. But it's very important to us in how we want our kids to be raised. And it caught our attention. As we left the Sabbath school class that day and made our way up to the church, we were neither overlooked and ignored, nor were we bombarded by excited members who were just waiting to pounce on visitors. You know there's a fine line between those, right? Because every church we've ever been in, we found some of both. There's some people that, I mean, you're like, "Uh, we're here, hi, we don't know anything or anyone, and nobody even cares. And then there's those that are just waiting, they're like, that's a new face, and they just jump on you. And you're like, (laughs) space, please, just a little bit of space. None of that happened when we came here. And yet everyone who approached us made us feel like we were welcome and that we were desired here that it was important that we be a part of the program here. Everyone wanted us to feel comfortable and to feel like we were just at home. Is that some hospitality? I like it. I like it. The fourth thing was, as we headed into the sanctuary, there were some folks that sat kind of over here in this little area. We sat back there. Um... And they turned around and they noticed that we were new. They didn't recognize us and they gave us a big smile and they welcomed us to the Bowman Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. They weren't afraid that we were new. Again, they wanted us to feel welcome. And then they did something really interesting. They made some kind of something out of papers and they gave them as little gifts to the girls. That really impressed them. Like, I cannot tell you how much that impressed them. Something so small, yet had such a big impact. A smile, a greeting, and a small gift. 
We were really impressed by this. True story, I want to tell you, as we were here that day, we entered into the worship service, and June Gooch, who I've known for probably since third grade, was singing the special music, and she was singing a Lauren Daigle song, and my girls love Lauren Daigle. And as soon as the song began to play, they knew what it was. And they stood up, and they came out in the aisle way, and then they ran back in. Daddy, is that Lauren Daigle? (laughs) I said, June's going to get a kick out of that. They were so excited. I want to tell you what impressed us about the worship service that day is it was very appropriate for anyone who had been here as a longtime Adventist, or if Somebody was here that this was the first time they had donned the steps of an Adventist church. It was a welcoming, appropriate service. It wasn't so Adventees that non-Adventists couldn't relate or learn or grow. And yet, an Adventist who had been here for a long time would have been encouraged, empowered, and would have grown. We felt like this was just a really warm and welcoming church. That really impressed us. Well, Sunday we went in to our interview. We were given the chance to give a devotional thought, which I'm going to do here again at some point with you guys. We were in interview for three hours. But it's not this church's fault. Because the church interviewed us for about an hour, hour and a half, and then we interviewed the church for equally as long. We had a lot of questions. We had a lot of things to do as well. You know, we've been in ministry long enough now that we know what God has called us to do. We're learning more every day how he is calling us to do it. And we don't have time to just play games. So we figured we're going to come in. We're just going to put all the cards on the table. This is what we're about. This is what God's called us to do. If you like it, great. If you don't, we're happy where we're at. See you guys later. Thank you. We've loved the time here. Three hours later, we get in the car. We begin to head back to the hotel. And Gianna begins to talk to us about the interview. And the thing that caught my attention about what she was saying is she was speaking in a southern accent. (laughs) I told Constance, we're doomed. (laughs) And the funniest thing about it at all is she had no clue she was doing it. (laughs) And it gave us a big chuckle as we headed back to the hotel that evening. Now, I was chuckling more than Constance because Constance doesn't know what a southern accent is. I grew up in Virginia, I do. She will learn to her if you speak American. If you speak English, then you have an accent. As we headed back to work in Washington and life began to get back to normal, Constance and I had to begin wrestling with the call that this church had made. Rick can tell you it was not an easy thing for us. It was perhaps one of the greatest struggles that we've had in a call at any place. We were really impressed with Bowman Hills, but we really love Pasco. We love our church family and our friends. We love the work that God had called us to do there. But there's even more than that. My mom and my dad, my middle brother and his wife and kids, my wife's sister, her kids, and husband. They're all back there. That's our family. That's who we're close to. In fact, all of my family, with two exceptions, are back there. Constance has a brother in Chattanooga, and I have a brother in Virginia. We were leaving behind a lot of things. We were really, really struggling. What it ultimately came down to was, Lord, we want you to make it clear what you want us to do. If you want us to go, we're going to go. If you want us to stay, we're going to stay. But you have to make it clear. We need to know what you're trying to do. 
we need to understand what you're trying to say. We prayed and we prayed for a couple of weeks. And yet, even after, after several days of fasting, I'm Italian and I like to eat. Fasting is very challenging for me. <laughs> but this was so important. After several days of fasting and praying, we still didn't have any clear direction as to what God would have us to do. You know, Constance and I decided just after we first got married that our marriage and our lives was going to be firmly placed in God's hands. We were not going to take from God his prerogative to be the guide in our life. We were going to seek and follow his will rather than inserting our own in his place. And we wanted to do that without reserve. And for nearly 18 years now, he has been working, showing us what that looks like. And we have been learning and growing, learning to see things in a different way, to hear things in a different way, to walk by faith and not by sight. Every place that God had ever called us to, he had been very clear that that's exactly what he wanted us to do. It was the first time we had a little bit of doubt. Now, I want to tell you right up front, we would tell people we were 95, a little bit later, we're 98% sure God is calling us to Bowman Hills, but that 2%... Mm, that was painful. Because the last thing you want to do is head out somewhere where you're not sure if God's really called you to go. And so we prayed and we prayed, what is it that God wants us to do? The Georgia Cumberland Conference was tremendously supportive of us. Rick and, and uh, Mr. Maddox Victor Maddox. They just walked with us through the process. They, they, didn't, they made it clear they wanted us to come, but they didn't push us. They gave us space. They prayed with us. They encouraged us. They worked with us. One day I was talking with a godly friend of mine, and in our conversation I explained to him that in our moving, one of the things that was a real struggle is I felt that it was wrong to leave Pasco when we were just preparing to enter into this evangelistic effort that we had worked so hard on. That was a real struggle for me because I, I don't want to leave a responsibility undone and leave people hanging. And little did I know that within two months, my evangelism coordinator, who had done so much work, would die tragically in an accident while on vacation on Hawaii. He found him at the bottom of a pool. To this day, they don't know why he passed. My friend said to me, you know what I think you need to do? I think you need to be upfront with the church. You were upfront with the church in the interview. You need to be upfront with the church in this. If you're not comfortable leaving before you finished what you promised to do, you need to let them know. So I let Rick know. I let Tyson know. I let Victor know. This is something that we're wrestling with. The thought was, if we did that, we would leave it in the hands of the church. If the church was comfortable with waiting for us to come, that would be confirmation that God was calling us to come here. If the church was like, man, eight months is a long time, um, we don't think so, then we were going to be just fine, very happily staying where we were at. And Bowman Hill said, well, wait. I had peace. I felt, okay, this is what God wants us to do. I was so happy, finally, all that stress and all of that burden was gone for a whole hour. <laughs> and then I told my dad what we had decided to do. Yeah. <laughs> my parents are very godly people. My parents, my wife's parents, they were praying for us through this whole thing. But my dad said, I think you're making a big mistake. But I had already given my word, and we were going to come. 
I'm looking at the time here, realizing I've got to cut some things short. I want to tell you, we decided we were going to come no matter what, and it wasn't for two more months until God confirmed, this is exactly what I'm calling you to do. Now, my wife will argue with me. She'll tell you she knew all along. <laughs> I was the one that had to have it figured out, but God made it very clear. The same Sabbath that it was said that we would be coming here is the same Sabbath that we told our church out there that we were leaving. And within a few weeks, we started the evangelistic series. It was one of the most powerful series that I've ever been a part of. And I've sat through the evangelist presentation several times. I think it had a lot to do with the timing. This time in earth's history. The spirits moving and speaking, it was just palpable. You could sense it. As the series wrapped up, we headed out here to begin looking for a house. We arrived on a Monday and our uh, realtor, he said, listen, we're gonna hit the road real hard. I've got eight to 10 houses for you guys to look at. <laughs> You're not scaring me. <laughs> we saw 16 houses the first day and almost as many the second day. And by the third day, we were in trouble. Every place that we looked at had some kind of problem and we couldn't figure out what in the world is going on? What is God trying to tell us? Why is it so hard to find a house? I want to say a big thank you to my friend Jason Lears, who I've known since high school. His grandmother was my math teacher. He crawled under a number of houses for us to help us make sure everything was good. And he saved us, actually, on one house in particular. He saved us big time. What was God trying to do? We had whittled it down to two houses on Wednesday. We made an offer on the one that we wanted the most. It was like, this meets everything that we need. But the guy who was selling the house wanted $70,000 more than it was worth. It had been on the market for like three months. No one had looked at it, the realtor said. Well, of course not. Look what he's asking for the house. He rejected our offer. It was literally the last house that we looked at that became the house that we now live in. It was a roller coaster ride. We headed back to Pasco. We said our final goodbyes. We got things packed up. The moving truck came on the 5th and picked up our stuff. And we made our way heading east. I'm going to ask the guys back there to throw up some pictures. We're going to do this quick. I know I'm a couple minutes over. But I want to just show you a few pictures of what it was like on our drive here. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail um, because of time. But that's what it looked like in our house just before the moving truck backed up to the door. <laughs> Pasco's in the desert, by the way. And we had three or four inches of snow. I, I had to run to Lowe's earlier in the morning. The sun hadn't even come up yet. I'm pulling into the house and I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be an interesting moving day. It was. The guys slipped and fell many times carrying our stuff. We hit the road. This is what the road looked like as we hit the road out of Spokane <laughs> and Montana and Wyoming and more Wyoming. By the way, I, I took this because it, the picture with the camera is really nice because it stops the snow from blowing, you know, so you can get, when you're driving, it doesn't look like that. Just white like this, and, and it was blowing at 40 miles an hour. There were signs all along the highway saying 40 mile an hour, steady winds, and then gusts above that. And we felt it because as we're driving, there were several times, there was a pickup truck in front of me. The wind would blow the back of the pickup truck out. 30 degree angle, he's going down the highway like this, and then fishtailing catch, he's doing 70. <laughs> but he was from there, it was normal for him. <laughs> the back end blew out on our CRV. My wife was driving an Accord. It was low enough to the ground. She didn't get blown around too much. But the back end of the CRV, she's like, you moved six inches. I'm like, I felt it. <laughs> it was crazy. As we were getting down into the end of Wyoming, we were starting to stress. You know, our plan was to take the northern route and cut across. But the thing was, is you know, this big blizzard went through and they closed the highway down. So we started heading south. They closed the next highway down. We started heading more south. They closed the next highway down. We're like, we're going to have to drive to Colorado Springs to get to Tennessee. 
By the way, that's exactly what happened. We had to drive to Colorado Springs to get to Tennessee because Highway 70 was closed. We had to cut up through the middle. By the way, Valerie made this statement about being in the middle of nowheres in Kansas. That's everywhere, Kansas. We drove through there. <laughs> we know. I just want to, I want to show you a little video of my wife. This is in Wyoming. We stopped at a rest area to let the dogs do their business, put gas in the car. The dogs didn't want to get out of the car. That's how cold it was. It was probably negative 16, and the wind was blowing at 50 miles an hour. I said I found a snow fairy. <laughs> Made it to Did you understand a word she said? I didn't either, and we were this far apart from each other. And then you all recognize that sign, don't you? Knoxville, Atlanta. We were in Chattanooga. Friends, this morning, I just want to tell you, God has been so good, but he's been teaching us something for a long time. He's been teaching us for years that we need to see by faith and not by sight. The only way you're going to have peace in life is when we learn to see with new eyes and walk by faith rather than sight. He's also been telling us that that's how our confidence will grow because we can face challenges with peace when we know even if everything is out of control and I have no control of what's happening here, he does. And he knows what he's doing. And lastly, everything that we were depending on came through just when it needed to, very rarely before that. I'll share the story with you another time about how Rick saved us to get into the house. God has been good. Church family, I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited to be a part of this church, excited to get to know you. And we pray together. Lord, we just want to thank you so much for your leading and guiding in our life. Lord, be with us now as we break for Sabbath school. Empower our lives. Use us in your work this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.